As connoisseurs of the arts, we collectively recognize certain works of art to be pivotal to their respective mediums. Movies, like The Godfather or Citizen Kane. Works of literature, like Hamlet and Faust. Compositions by Chopin and Stravinsky. These works represent the evolutionary pinpoints for their respective mediums. They are the culmination of all that came before, and all that follows after owes their existence to them. In respect to the young medium of video games, we have already seen several seminal works of art. Ocarina of Time, Half-Life, System Shock 2, World of Warcraft, Metal Gear Solid, Final Fantasy VII, and many others. Even if we have not played these games ourselves, we are all aware of them, and we respect them for revolutionizing and, sometimes beginning, their respective genres. As of late, I have turned my focus towards these influential works to try and understand why they had such a profound impact on the medium. I cross-referenced numerous top 10, 25, 100 lists across the internet to see which ones were held in the highest esteem. Aside from Ocarina of Time, the one game that I found consistently around the top of these lists was Chrono Trigger. I knew nothing about this game aside from the fact that it was a JRPG, and that some of the greatest minds behind other great JRPGs like Final Fantasy and Xenogears worked on this project. I've always wanted to play it just to see what the big deal was, but when I asked my audience whether they thought I should do a video on it, I received mixed signals. See, most of the time when I seek out a game to analyze, I make my choices based on whether or not the game reportedly has a profound narrative. When I asked my audience on a number of occasions whether Chrono Trigger met this requirement, I was told that it was a simple story as often as I was told that it was complex. So, I chose to roll the dice and decide for myself whether or not I should spend my already limited time on this 30-year-old JRPG risking the possibility that I might not have anything worthwhile to say on it when I was done. I will address whether or not the narrative did reach that state of profundity in a moment. For now, I will give my overall verdict, and it is one that I don't recall ever giving to any other game. While it may or may not be profound, Chrono Trigger is perfect. When you consider all the different disciplines that go into making a game, music, art direction, Gameplay mechanics. Chrono Trigger harmonizes these disciplines with mathematical precision. They were state of the art back in 1995, and in many ways, continue to be in 2022. At no point does the gameplay become tiresome, grindy, or overly complicated like they do in other JRPGs. At no point do certain elements feel like they have aged poorly like they have in other beloved retro titles. If you are capable of ignoring the existence of modern RPGs set in graphically detailed, three-dimensional worlds, you will witness within Chrono Trigger a JRPG in its simplest, but also its most sublime form. When you add in the fact that Chrono Trigger is responsible for giving the medium of gaming so many things that we take for granted today, be it multiple endings based on your moral choices or the ability to go into New Game Plus, it becomes very clear to me why this game rests at the top of so many top 10 lists. Though it might not be complexly perfect, it is simply perfect. But as for the story, does it reach the level of profundity that we find in aforementioned games like Metal Gear Solid and System Shock 2? My answer might seem like a cop-out at first, but just bear with me. It depends on who plays it. By the way, that's not an appeal to the subjectivity of art. The quality of Chrono Trigger's story varies on how one approaches the game. I think most people will play through Chrono Trigger and only witness a familiar, by-the-numbers time travel story. By that, I mean the stereotypical Back to the Future plot where you go into the past and do something there to affect the future. Sure, there are one or two moments one will experience that have some emotional depth to them, like with the characters of Frog and Magus, but those moments are far surpassed by similar characters in other games and media. This remains true for about 70-80% to of the game, but as for the other 20-30%, to well, that can be missed entirely, depending on, like I said, who you are. 
and how you play. If you choose to go off the linear path and explore the various locations from the various time periods, you will be rewarded with side quests and endings that contain some of the most original and impactful storytelling that I have ever witnessed in a game. What makes the stories in those quests and endings so impactful are the themes of free will and existentialism that pervade them. The characters' struggles with existential dread and their respective triumphs over existential dread are so poetic and so positive that they are arguably unmatched. I will go into greater detail, but now I feel compelled to provide a synopsis to those who, up until recently, were like me and that they heard of Chrono Trigger but know nothing about it. Chrono Trigger centers not on one protagonist, but on seven different characters from many different time periods. There are the characters Chrono, Luca, and Nadia, also known as Marl, from 1000 AD, Glenn, aka Frog, from 600 AD, Robo from 2300 AD, Magus from 12,000 BC, and Ayla from 65 million BC. These seven characters encounter each other across various time periods. This is made possible by the opening of time gates via multiple different methods, be it through Luca's inventions, the manipulation of reality by magicians, or by unknown forces. The common purpose that unites these individuals is the desire to defeat an extraterrestrial being named Lavos. Lavos is an alien that crash-landed on Earth around 65 million BC. The alien is much like that of a stereotypical Lovecraftian Great One, in that its true purpose and function transcend human comprehension. All we know for certain about Lavos is that its crash landing provoked the Ice Age, and a slumber that would last until 1999 AD. When Lavos woke up in that year, the world virtually ended. Prior to that, as Lavos slept, there were those who would attempt to understand the alien's power and wield it, such as Queen Zeal and the denizens of her kingdom, also named Zeal. But they, like other fictional characters who encounter Lovecraftian gods, become corrupted in the face of unimaginable power. It is up to our seven heroes to defeat Queen Zeal, Lavos, and the forces in service to both across five time spans. If they fail, then Queen Zeal's lust for power will awaken Lavos, and the world will end. That is the focus of the main story. Aside from the creative idea of telling a story across multiple time periods, there is not much else to the primary plot that makes it transcendently good, at least in my mind. I figure that the vast majority of people who have played this game will have only experienced the main plot, and understandably so. Unless you can pay close attention to what certain NPCs say and can recall all the different locations across all time spans, figuring out how to start these side quests becomes difficult. This was a bold game design choice on the part of the developers, especially because that content includes some of the best storytelling and gameplay in the game. And even if you find the start points for these quests, you need to think deeply about how your actions in the past might affect things in the future and, by proxy, might affect your ability to get these endings at all. But by demanding an increased effort and attention from the gamer, it compels a deeper emotional investment and provides subsequently greater reward for both the gamer and the characters. One of the best examples of this comes with the character known as Glenn, also known as Frog. This character was the only one that really demonstrated any emotional depth in the main plot, at least for me. But still, the main plot doesn't provide the emotional closure that this character needed. This pattern is consistent with other characters in the game, but we'll get to those in a moment. In respect to Glenn, he reluctantly became a knight for the royal army. I say reluctantly because he had demonstrated an intense pacifism and lack of self-assertion for his entire life. Glenn's best friend, who was also in the royal army, Cyrus, would chastise him for this, calling him as soft as a marshmallow. Glenn suffered the ultimate repercussion for these faults when he watched Cyrus be murdered by the aforementioned Magus. Glenn could have made the choice to fight in this circumstance, to avenge the death of his friend, 
but he was unable to on account of his pacifism. As Glenn knelt before Cyrus's body, in a shocked and grief-stricken state, Magus noted that Glenn appeared like a frog, being glared at by a snake. This inspired Magus to transform Glenn into a reflection of his personal weakness, into an actual frog. For ten years, Glenn lived in self-imposed exile, wallowing in guilt over this event. It wasn't until time travel brought the other protagonists to him that he began to move beyond his decade of inaction. It appears that Glenn made this choice not out of his own personal desire, but because the fate of the world was at stake. While this is commendable and heroic, it doesn't really address Glenn's grief. You only see Glenn find closure to this grief in an easily missable side quest at the end of the game. In that side quest, Glenn and the other protagonists travel to 1000 AD to repair a castle named the Northern Ruins. There, they discover the restless spirit of Cyrus. After the side quest is completed by repairing the ruins along with Cyrus's grave, Cyrus relieves Glenn of his guilt. What's notable about this exchange is that Cyrus does not congratulate Glenn for fixing his past mistakes, but rather, for developing the will to do so. Ultimately, it was Glenn's initial lack of will that fostered his grief and self-hatred in the first place. Even if he was able to right the wrongs of his past by saving the world with the other protagonists, that wouldn't have fixed the root problem. It was only by developing the strength of will, and having someone point this achievement out to him, that he was able to overcome his past identity, to overcome his existential dread, and forge a new path for himself. The theme of taking on new identities through strength of will is of the utmost importance in Chrono Trigger. It is a pattern that we see with several of the other characters. Just like with Glenn, the other characters make transitions from old identities to new ones via a change in name. Robo, for instance, was originally named Prometheus. He was programmed with the sole purpose of studying the human race for the benefit of the robot race. In his side quest, one of his past robot companions and their leader wished to reprogram Robo in order to force this identity back onto him, but he refuses. Rather, he chooses to be defined by the memories that he created and not by a preordained function. He is not, and never was, Prometheus. He is Robo. With Magus, he used to be a prince in Queen Zeal's kingdom. Back then, he went by the name Janus. He revolts against his past villainy by trying to destroy Lavos and reconcile with Glenn. Nadia had the role of princess forced upon her from birth. She attempts to escape this role by joining Chrono and the others on their adventures. It is here that she takes on the name Marl. For the most part, we never see these characters make the full transition from one identity to the other in the main plot. We only see that full transition in the easily missable side quest or ending, both of which are often difficult to achieve. But this is true of any real-life existential struggle. Whether it's with reality or Chrono Trigger, if you make the choice to contend with the suffering inherent to life, there will be some form of reward. It might not take the form you expect, but it will come. In respect to Chrono Trigger, the reward for the gamer is the storytelling in these side quests and endings. It filled me with a sense of emotional satisfaction that I've only ever experienced a few other times in games, namely in Final Fantasy IX, Metal Gear Solid 2, and Nier Automata, all of which happen to deal with the same themes. I will note, though, that there is one potential ending that Magus can receive that is quite disheartening. I will detail it for you because it is relevant to the themes of free will and existentialism. In that ending, we find out that Magus's sister, Scala, Princess of Zeal, had somehow unified with Lavos. Magus and the other party members fight a long battle in order to try and separate the two, only to find out that their efforts were in vain. After the battle, Scala briefly wakes up, only to tell Magus that she, like Lavos, wishes for everything that exists to be erased. 
Much like Faust's Mephistopheles, she felt that the life she led, and life in general, was so full of cruelty and despair that it would be better to never have existed. She then sends Magus through a time portal, leaving her all alone, floating in an infinite void of nothingness, one that reflects her interior state. The scene then cuts to Magus in his own dark void. He figures that if he cannot save his sister, no matter how hard he tries, then there is no point in existing. Before he makes the choice to fade away, he wishes that if any part of him somehow remains, that it will be the birth of a more meaningful, sensical world. His wish is ultimately fulfilled. Though he fades into the void, he comes back to life, albeit without any memory of what happened. This ending, though pessimistic, does have a positive philosophical undercurrent to it. Even when it seems like fate is steering us in a singular direction, there is something special about human beings that enables them to refuse. This reminds me of the famous Russian author Fyodor Dostoevsky's criticism of determinism. To paraphrase, he said that if there is no such thing as free will, and we are all fated towards the same meaningless outcome, that won't stop human beings from trying to rebel against fate, from trying to will free will into existence. Chrono Trigger gives great significance to this human peculiarity, to our desire to assert our will no matter the circumstances, that the boundaries of objective, material reality will break down in order to accommodate it. On multiple occasions in the game, the human will is responsible for miraculous events, of which Magus's willing of a new reality is just one example. The most prominent example of this metaphysical power comes in the form of Dreamstone. According to a journal written by one of the game's secondary characters, Balthazar, Dreamstone was first discovered by the most ancient of humanity's ancestors. Balthazar describes the Dreamstone as having a power beyond human comprehension. That power was the ability to will our dreams into existence. In this way, Dreamstone functions much like that of a human, in that it sits on the border between realities. On the one hand, it is a part of the determinist material universe, but on the other hand, it can bend that material universe to its will by dreaming. It is by dreaming that both stone and humans can will their own outcomes, outside of what the deterministic universe has set out for them. The most important use of the Dreamstone and Chrono Trigger was the willing of the Mammon machine into existence by Queen Zeal, a machine that was used to siphon energy from Lavos. At first, doing this did not seem to have any negative consequences, it led to the land of Zeal becoming the most advanced civilization ever. Unfortunately though, Lavos's power was so great and held such promise that it drove Queen Zeal to, well, zealotry. That zealotry was predicated on what is arguably the ultimate, unrealized dream of the human race, eternal life. Queen Zeal saw that potential within Lavos and sought to attain it for herself at any cost. Yet the Queen's dream of eternal life for herself bore too great a price. It intruded upon the fabric of reality in the form of the Black Omen ship. This ship cut through into all of the game's timelines, threatening to change reality in accordance with Zeal's will. This was such a disruption to the natural order of things that it might have caused the planet itself to retaliate. There is a long-held fan theory that the planet in Chrono Trigger is a living entity with its own consciousness and its own destiny. Because Zeal and Lavos are intruding upon that destiny and the destinies of the humans who live on the planet, the planet resists this through the opening of time gates. The evidence for this, once again, can be missed if you don't do one of the end game side quests. In one scene, the party members discuss how and why some of the time gates appear to be opening. At first, Robo theorized that it was Lavos randomly opening these gates, but then he proposed an alternate theory. He suggests that maybe the opening of these gates was purposeful, that some ethereal entity wanted the party members to go through these gates. 
This makes sense because if the planet has a destiny, and its destiny is intertwined with the humans that live on the planet, then maybe the planet would bend the fabric of reality in order to preserve the natural order. Alternatively, Robo suggests that the entity slash planet was not opening these gates for the party, but for itself, for some unknown reason. The character known as Ayla suggests that maybe the entity was dying, equating the opening of the gates to one's life flashing before their eyes during death. If we go with the theory that this entity is the planet, and the planet is dying on account of Queen Zeal, then it would make sense to equate the time gates with the planet's life flashing before its eyes. Whatever the case may be, it is evident that there is something willing these miraculous events to happen, and that miraculous will is something possessed by both gods and mortals in Chrono Trigger. Now you, the viewer, might not believe in the existence of free will or the metaphysical power of will. That's fine, but that's irrelevant to this discussion. Chrono Trigger is not presenting the concept of will in this way because the developers are making some sort of confession of faith. It is paying tribute to the human spirit, to the exclusively human ability to dream, and to make those dreams come true. Whether it is with the optional quests in Chrono Trigger or the optional quests in your own life, you can choose to ignore them and tumble unconsciously towards your own fate, or you can embrace those optional quests for what they often are, the more difficult yet more meaningful pathways towards fulfilling your dreams. When things get too difficult, the choice to persevere becomes all the more meaningful. When you feel out of control and destined for the worst outcome, you can still choose your attitude in the face of fate. It is in moments like these, where we maintain our integrity and our courage in the face of impossible odds, that legends are born. That power is not exclusive to superheroes in the realm of fantasy. That power is something we all possess. That is the core message of Chrono Trigger. It is an uncommonly positive message, one which renders Chrono Trigger, in my mind, an existential masterpiece, one that has yet to be surpassed 30 years later. I know what some of you longtime Chrono fans are wondering. Have I played Chrono Cross? No. Will I be playing it soon and doing a video on it? Yes. Stay tuned for that. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video at all, make sure to give it a like. It's free, easy, to just do it. Yeah, you. No, don't you click that X button. Hit the like button. It's okay, it's not gonna hurt you. <laughs> I'm just playing. But really, hitting the like button actually helps me out a lot. Special thanks to Gaming University and Cage Lost for discussing this game with me and double checking my work. Until next time, stay yellow.